Ladies and gentlemen, the president is in the building. It's my job to make sure that we fix these messes, even if I don't make it. But that's only going to happen if we pull together and focus on the big things. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. All the best wishes. On April 11, 2009, Lyndon LaRouche delivered a warning to the United States so that future generations could be spared from the kind of dark age that this Wall Street and London provoked crisis would assuredly deliver. This decades long meltdown had recently entered a new phase inside the United States and had been accelerating toward the point of no return since July of 2007, when LaRouche delivered a public webcast addressing the crisis, as well as its remedy, by proposing the Homeowner and Bank Protection Act. The dying nation was faced with yet another challenge, the takeover of the presidency by a group of fascists known as behaviorists. To make matters worse, the new commander-in-chief had a failed personality, under the conditions of the accelerating breakdown, the saner elements which occupied positions around the president would be unable to deter the would-be tyrant from assuming the role of an Emperor Nero or Adolf Hitler. So LaRouche styled the famous image of the president's face with a Hitler mustache above his lip to alert the population to the crisis that was unfolding. Across the country, the responses to this image ranged from hysteria to enthusiastic endorsement. Many people agreed with the comparison privately, but were still afraid to act openly against the image of Barack Obama. The behaviorists who influence Obama deny any distinction exists between man and beast. Controlling your diet, how much money you spend, even killing you, are all appropriate means of reducing the deficit. This kind of thinking would have collapsed human civilization long ago if it weren't for a different conception of man present throughout history. As president, it is not possible for Obama to understand this. Let us now peek inside the White House for a glimpse into the personality of Obama to discover why. Classified by classical psychology as the narcissistic personality, it must be understood that our dissection takes us beyond all the superficial features of the patient. While Obama is popularly noted for his self-adulation, his charisma, his big ego, and his ambition, the less understood quality which pervades his every action is a feeling of worthlessness. Where most people's personalities are a window into their own sense of identity, the narcissist has no identity, and his personality is styled to conceal this fact. As charming as Obama can seem, he is, in fact, incapable of relating to other human beings, and everything he strives to do is to try and escape his worthlessness like a prisoner. But because of his own built-in failures, his attempts always end in frustration. This fatal struggle to maintain a self-image as against his own sneaking self-estimation, all is fair game if it will keep him from confronting the futility of his attempts. The constant thought which motivates him is a mere hope 
that with enough determination, by calling on something which he knows isn't there, he may ultimately triumph over the voices that torment him with his worthlessness, the very voices he ascends to by challenging them and trying to prove them wrong. The narcissist feels threatened by the accomplishments of others, and his constant fits of rage, even in normal social environments, requires a support team to manage his frequent tantrums. He will even take personal revenge against someone who he feels has not considered his needs well enough in their own pursuits. All humans he encounters are cardboard cutouts, and the only reason they are tolerated, allowed by him to exist, is that they do not challenge his worthlessness. As more and more of many among you had learned since the announcement I delivered in an international webcast on July 25th, 2007, that we have been not in a recession, not in a mere depression, but in a general global breakdown crisis of the economy of the entire planet. As long as the present structure of economy in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere continues. The world is going more and more deeply into a general breakdown crisis, which would probably result in the elimination, within a generation or two, of two-thirds of the present level of the world's population. A reduction of the population of the planet from 6.5 to 6.7 billion people today to less than 2 billion in a short period of time. Entire cultures and entire languages and entire nations would disappear. If this current trend in the, in the, Bush, in the, <laughs> in the Obama administration is allowed to continue. So the change must come. It must come soon. It must come su suddenly while we still have a presidential team in place which is rational. The elimination of these factors, such as Larry Summers and this crowd identified by Time magazine, must occur immediately, because if it does not occur, the following will be true. The situation we face in the United States and worldwide is comparable in many respects to Rome under the dictatorship of the Emperor Nero. The character of the president under, under these conditions is of that form. He is not really aware of what he's doing. He has no comprehension of many of the technical issues, such as economic issues, which he's treating. None whatsoever. He has no clear understanding of strategic interest. He's an intelligent person in other respects but he has no competence in these areas in which he, for which he is largely responsible as president. And therefore, only if you eliminate this crowd identified by Time magazine as the controlling influences on him and put him back into the dependency upon the advice of capable people in his cabinet and related positions, could the United States survive? If, as in the case of the Emperor Nero, who is historically a similar precedent for this kind of problem, if you don't eliminate those factors and let him run under the control of this crowd identified by Time magazine, uh, he will eliminate, as Nero did, all his own advisors from outside that particular team. At that point, with a deteriorating world situation, we can approach the condition of a non-recoverable situation on this planet. We can go into a new dark age of all humanity. And therefore, that change must occur now. Barry Obama was always ready for change. Growing up on Oahu, he was one of the only black kids in his school. Barry's mother, a white woman from Kansas would have to help him cope with being different all by herself. 
when he was just an infant, his father, Barack Obama Sr., abandoned him to pursue a scholarship at Harvard for a government position he would take up in Kenya, where he already had a wife and kids. His mother soon remarried and took six-year-old Barry and his stepsister to live with his new stepfather in Jakarta. When she realized that growing up in Indonesia was having a bad effect on her son, she sent him back to Hawaii to be raised by his grandparents. Barry only saw his father one more time, and it was his grandmother who helped him through his high school years at the Punahou Academy. He relates to experiencing tremendous difficulties fitting in at the elite white institution he attended, and admits to turning to drugs and alcohol. He started to doubt that even his mother, who had taught him everything he knew about the civil rights movement, understood what being black was really about, and he became very anxious to leave the island and begin anew the quest to locate his identity elsewhere. But before he would leave the island, the chief hallmarks of his personality were already deeply ingrained. He started out at Occidental College and then moved on to Columbia, where he spent most of his time in near isolation in his apartment, poring over books, especially engaged by the writings of Nietzsche, a personal friend of Richard Wagner. One day, Barry got a phone call from Dan Schomann with a job offer as a community organizer in Chicago's South Side. Obama accepted the new opportunity, moved to Chicago, and for the first time in his life, directly experienced African-American culture. He was still an agnostic like his mother, but he even attended church for the first time to better help him as an organizer of the religious community. One of his most significant accomplishments as an organizer was his direct initiative to ask the government to subsidize the removal of asbestos from an apartment building. His appeal made it all the way to the Capitol, but was returned with no money. Dissatisfied with nothing to show for his three years of hard work, Obama decided he would model himself after the first African-American mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington. As mayor, he could do much more for the people of Chicago. So he left the South Side and attended Harvard Law School. It was here that he changed his name to Barack and also became the Harvard Law Review's first ever Hawaiian president. True to his promise, Barack returned to Chicago. But when he realized that even with his law degree, he had little chances of unseating the new mayor, Richard M. Daley, he settled into Hyde Park, got married, took a job at a law firm, as well as a teaching position at the University of Chicago lecturing on constitutional law, and sat down to write his memoirs at the age of 30. It was 442 pages long when he finished it. Barack would take his book with him to see his dying mother and presented it to her before her life was claimed by ovarian cancer. Her son, who she raised alone, had chosen to call the book Dreams from My Father. Barack's attempts to bring himself closer to the African-American community seemed more and more to be disconnecting him from the people of the south side of Chicago. Alice Palmer, the state senator, decided she would run in the upcoming election for U.S. Senator. Barack met with her, and they forged a plan for him to run for her open seat, and by endorsing each other's campaigns, they could advance the cause of African Americans by gaining two new political offices for the Democratic Party. But when it became clear that Palmer had overestimated her chances at Washington and would run for her old seat, Obama refused to step down. She ran anyway, since she knew her constituents would be happy to have her represent them for another term. But Obama challenged the legality of the signatures she collected, and before she could correct the technical slip-up, she was removed from the ballot, and Obama ran unopposed. He next tried running for Congress against the former Black Panther, Bobby Rush, who had worked in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with Stokely Carmichael and was mentored into politics personally under Harold Washington. Obama was cruising for a bruising. Blinded by his ambition, his reputation was hurt so much that he had no choice but to lick his wounds and wait for his next opportunity to strike. He promised his wife that if he didn't win his next election, he would quit politics for good. And so he pulled together a team, and with the support of David Axelrod, ran a multi-million dollar campaign for Senate. 
The rest, as you know, is history. Here is a case study of another narcissistic personality who made it all the way to the top. It will be followed by a second similar study. Nero became emperor of Rome at the age of 17. The young emperor, at first, only indulged in moderate drunkenness, revelry, and amour, while his mother ran the empire for him. But, unreproved, and seeing the public business still carried forward, Nero began to believe that whatever he did was right, and began to indulge in each of these practices in a more open fashion. The young emperor soon came to despise instruction, not wishing to acknowledge the greater sense of his superiors. Innumerable acts of violence and insult, rape and murder were committed by the emperor, after one of his poisonings went wrong and his treachery was exposed to view, many leaders, instead of condemning Nero, focused on preserving their own lives and withdrew from serving the public interest. Nero was no longer afraid to make himself conspicuous and give free rein to all his desires. He would appear as an actor of tragedies on the stage and a competitor in the chariot races. He even returned home victorious from the Olympic Games. He would frequent taverns and wander about town like a private person by day and night. He would even break into homes and shops. Like Don Giovanni, he would carry on his nocturnal revels with the idea that his incognito was impenetrable, even though his signature brutality was recognized by everybody. Nero attended the theater and incited the crowds to become disorderly for entertainment. He forbade soldiers from protecting the public with the argument that no one but the emperor ought to be guarded by them, not even his mother. The idea that Rome would outlive Nero did not sit well with the emperor, so he developed plans to bring the city to an end during his lifetime. One day, he sent his men to kindle blazes in the different quarters of the city. The soldiers had their eye on plunder and did nothing to help the Romans extinguish the blaze. A sudden wind caught the fire and swept it over whatever remained. The public, reminded of how their city had been similarly laid waste by the Gauls, gathered together and lamented. While the population was in this state of mind, Nero mounted the roof of his palace, where he could take the whole scene in with a sweeping glance, and striking a tune on his lyre, listened to himself sing. This is a question of guts. The question of guts, which I raise today, you know, the President of the United States is acting like something worse than a fool. He should not be let out without a leash. It should be go right, ring around the world. He's going to make a mess of things. You've got to get him under control. A true narcissus case, like Nero, is not concerned with reality. He's concerned with his illusion. 
He lives really in a fantasy life. As long as he's in control of his position with that retinue on which he depends. Remember, he depends on a very specific group of people, which is identified essentially by the Time magazine report. That's his personality. That's the truth. You are who you eat. Huh? You are what you're fed to be. He's fed to be a narcissist type of this type. Don't feed him. Don't feed the disease. And he's forced then to attempt to assimilate himself into a position where he's credible. Remove the credibility of the other thing. I mean, look, I said before, and I can say it again, he has a Nero problem. He's a contemporary Nero. Famous kind of problem. And if you leave him in there, you're going to find out the effect he's going to play. He's going to play the role of a Nero. He may not have the specific problems that Nero had, some of them. But he has this idea, this, this look, the one, I, the one, the miracle man, you see his instincts are wrong. And his, his, his self-adulation is manic, euphoric. Self-adulation. This is the mentality of the worst kind of dictator. Don't let him get in the position where he has that kind of power. Keep him under straight constraint, the legal constraint, within the American presidential system, as it works. Keep him in that constraint. If you don't, you're creating a monster. You don't want a Frankenstein monster. You don't want a Narcissus in the presidency. And he's a case of Narcissus, just like Nero. And the program is basically that of Nero. He's a danger to all humanity if you don't keep him under control. He's a danger to himself as well as everybody else. So you ain't persecuting him when you're protecting him from himself. In 1943, while the war in Europe was still underway, the Office of Strategic Services had a document prepared called Analysis of the Personality of Adolf Hitler with predictions of his future behavior and suggestions for dealing with him now and after Germany's surrender. Its purpose was to understand how Hitler would respond to the successful war plans of the Allies. Dr. Henry A. Murray, who prepared the report at Harvard, concluded on the basis of available accounts relating to Hitler's childhood and personal life that Hitler would react according to a narcissistic personality type. Hitler, like Obama, had a very complex set of experiences to contend with stemming from his relationship to his parents. He was his mother's third child, but the first to survive beyond the age of two. For this reason, his mother devoted extra attention to Adolf, and he showed great affection toward his mother. But he hated and even feared his father. Hitler was tall and skinny, and Adolf's mother was the only one who encouraged him to pursue his interest in art against his father's wishes that Adolf become a civil servant. After his father died, his mother sent Adolf to Vienna to attend art school. While he developed his skills in watercolor, Hitler did poorly in all other subjects and failed to graduate. He even applied for architecture school, but lacked the formal education necessary to pass the entrance exams. When his mother died in 1908 from cancer, the 19-year-old Hitler was prostrated with grief and spent the next three years wandering around Vienna, shoveling snow, painting houses, selling watercolor postcards, and it was here that he began developing his political ideology, including his anti-Semitism and anti-Slavism. Wagner, 
would have an influence on Hitler throughout his whole life, and since 12 he had been very familiar with his musical works, but also his political writings. He even preferred Wagner as against Mozart, and saw one of Wagner's operas, Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, over 100 times while Führer. In 1912, Hitler went to Munich and continued working various jobs to earn an income. In 1914, he enlisted in the army with enthusiasm and performed all his duties with distinction and bravery. He was wounded and sent home to recover, but in March 1917 was back at the front. Nevertheless, Hitler never rose above the rank of corporal. As a soldier, he remained aloof from his comrades, was zealous but very lonely. Through all the war, he never received a single parcel or letter. When the war was over, he had no home to return to and was appointed as an espionage agent of the insurgent Reichswehr which had just put down the Soviet Republic in Munich. Soon after, he came in contact with Anton Drexler and began what was to become the Nazi Party. By this time, the basic structure of his personality was already formed and he would exploit the flaws of his personality with considerable artistry, gaining influence over the affairs of a whole nation, and even tangle the world up in his inner turmoil. It would become a constant political tool for Hitler to project those weaknesses he located in himself, such as frailty, cowardice, and racial impurity, onto the masses of Germany, the motherland, or onto other nations of the world, which even in his last testament he characterized as the aggressors responsible for World War II. He had the same love-hate relationship to the submissive masses of Germany, which he was dependent on for power, as he had toward his mother, who he depended on for support, but who also consorted with his hated father. The purpose of the report was to provide policy recommendations for the consideration by the Allies. It was important not to overlook that the leader of the nation they were engaged in combat with was clinically insane. The denouement of drama approaches at every moment. The fiction of a command of fate only holds as long as there is success. Greater and greater to assuage the mounting feelings of anxiety and guilt. Aggression, therefore, has its limit. It cannot go beyond the highest point of success. When reached, the personality may collapse under the flood of its own guilt feelings. The danger posed by the self-induced downfall of a narcissist who had attained a position of power was deemed a very real threat. Hitler, like Nero, threatened suicide if either the Nazi party or the German Reich were destroyed. Already in 1943, it could be confidently predicted that Hitler's neurotic spells would increase in frequency and duration and his effectiveness as a leader would diminish. A list of all the possible endgame scenarios that Hitler might act out was prepared, and each scenario, along with the likelihood that it would occur, was examined in detail. The least desirable scenario, but also the most likely one, was a situation where Hitler would go insane and commit suicide. And that is exactly what happened. Nero, before sending his mother away to be killed, embraced her with a kiss. Mother, farewell, and happiness attend you. For you I live, and because of you I rule. She escaped from the plot, and unaware of her son's authorship of her own murder, sent her son the news not to worry that she was safe and all was well. Enraged, Nero killed the messenger and then dispatched the assassins once again, this time Upon hearing that she was now dead, he would not believe the news until he beheld the victim with his own eyes. I did not know I had so beautiful a mother, was what he said upon seeing her. The population, upon hearing the report, though horrified, were joyful because they thought that now he would surely come to ruin. Nero, not having a word of truth from anyone, and seeing that all approved of what he had been doing, thought that either his actions had escaped notice or that he had conducted himself correctly. 
when Galba was proclaimed emperor by the soldiers, Nero fell into a great fear and began forming plans to kill all the senators, burn the city to the ground, and sail to Alexandria to live in anonymity as a musician. But when he perceived that he had been deserted even by his own bodyguards, he fled immediately. He was searched for in all directions, and when he perceived they were drawing near, like Hitler, he perished, believing that his suicide was one of the world's greatest losses. Is it necessary to let the tragedy of President Obama play out just because this or that specific detail is currently unavailable to public scrutiny? Or should we wait and see if what has not yet transpired will prove us to have been wrong all along? To say, give Obama another chance, is like saying, give the alcoholic another drink. What are we doing to the poor man by keeping him in a position which will destroy him and the rest of us? And what kind of idea was it to allow a man like this to become president in the first place? Criminal charges would pour forward freely if only the immediate threat to our republic were of such a nature. Given Obama's state of mind, his fallback is a plea of insanity. The approach to Obama's impeachment is accepting the fact that unless we remove him from office constitutionally, we can do nothing to address the country's general breakdown crisis. And until this happens, we are governed by Obama. Our time frame is that as has been given us by Lyndon LaRouche's most recent forecast. The result of deviating from that timeline is the failure and end of humanity as we know it.